his hand is back, but that's not a big deal. Oh yeah, we've got 95, 96 people so far. All right, everyone. <laughs> All right, this is this is working at least. We know that people are here. We're here. Okay, ready to start? I think so. Yeah, I think I'm sure people will continue to trickle in, but we're already doing some lines. So let's get going. Hi everyone, and, and thanks for joining the first virtual tasting at Henry Winery. I know you um, have, a, have a list of upcoming events as well, but today the plan is to talk about the Bordeaux varieties in the Henry Vineyard and how we grow them and how we make wine from them um, and why we make the wines we make. But first, um, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Mike Henry, and what I do most here is the the farming, the beard management side of things. Um, Megan Carter is, is here with us and also uh, just out of sight, but very present is Angela Douglas, who is all of our bosses, <laughs> yes. Um, so what I would like to do is, is cover some of the, the farming and the viticulture, and a little of our history with these grapes. Um, and then we will, talk about how we make the wine, we'll uh, taste very briefly, um, and then we'll have a chance to answer any questions that you have. Um, this is a learning experience for all of us. Um, and in the event that the question and answer section is a complete flop, we've all invest, in, enlisted family members to uh, answer or ask questions for us at the right time. But first, uh, Megan is gonna tell us a little about this uh, system and how yeah. it works and how you can participate. Well, I imagine that many of you by now have become quite familiar with Zoom. I know I had not used it until this whole um, quarantine happened, but I feel like uh, I'm, I'm almost a pro now. You probably are as well. But uh, we wanted to let you know that we set this up in webinar format. So if any of you over the last week in all of your business meetings or um, family virtual happy hours have had that moment where 12 people try and talk at once, we're really trying to minimize that. So we've um, instead enabled at the bottom of your screen um, a chat function and a Q&A function. So um, please throw questions in there. We thank you all, everyone who submitted things in advance and we've got our, our notes and we're gonna try and cover a lot of those, but please do keep the questions coming and um, and keep the chat going. As Mike said, Angela's here, uh, she's, she's keeping an eye on that. So um, you have an option in the chat, you can send messages to panelists, which would be us, um, or to everybody. So feel free to chat amongst yourselves. Um, remember, Angela's watching, so don't say anything you wouldn't want Angela to read. Um, but we really do want to make this as much of a dialogue as we can, sort of given the technology. So, um, so yeah, thank you all very much for your questions and thank you for all of your outreach over the last couple of weeks. It's been an unusual time for everybody, I think. So we're really, really grateful um, for this wonderful community and we're excited to um, taste with you. Uh, as Mike said, we will taste briefly here, but don't wait for us. Please um, pour whatever you've got right now. We would love to hear what you are drinking. Um, hopefully a, a red blend or, or a ginger red of some kind, but please put that in the chat as well. We'd love to hear it. So uh, without any further ado, let's let's jump in. Great. Um, so yes, and I guess one of the good things about this is that we're all at home. Yeah. So <laughs> we're comfortable. Have, have an extra glass if that helps. Um, so what, what Bordeaux varieties mean for us uh, really is Merlot, Malbec, Petit Bordeaux, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Cabernet Franc. Um, and as you know, everything we bottle at the Henry Winery comes from grapes that we grow uh, in our estate vineyard here. Uh, and Petit Bordeaux, Merlot, Malbec, uh, and Cabernet Franc are not um, grapes that we grow a lot of. We have a few acres of each. Um, we have a lot more Cabernet Sauvignon, but each of these grapes, um, the Bordeaux grapes, uh, has its own personality and, and they're all um, very important in the blend that we make. Our, our, I don't know if you're able to see this, but I think uh, everyone here at some point has seen this wine. This is where most of the Bordeaux grapes have been picked up. Uh, but in Napa, prior to 1990, there was almost no Petit Bordeaux or Malbec. Um, in, in 1995, there were just 40 acres uh, of Malbec here, and that's the year where we planted our first and only uh, Malbec block. Um, we got cuttings at that time from the Opus One winery, uh, and it was a, 
a variety of Malbec that was very difficult to grow. And for, for 15 years, I, when anyone asked me what my biggest vineyard headache was, I said Malbec. Um, and one of the problems with it was that it was very unpredictable in terms of how much fruit it produced. So from this three acre block, there were years where we had a ton and a half of Malbec, uh, and there were years where we had 12 tons. And, and obviously that had a lot to do with um, the variation in, in some of the percentages of the Bordeaux blend over the years. Uh, we only have a little less than two acres of Merlot, um, and that's actually in three different clones. We don't, we don't make those clones separately. Um, but I, I suppose they each contribute something um, to the wine that we make. Merlot, as you know, is a, is a famous grape for a good reason. Um, it was one that uh, was and, and really still is very popular in Napa, but all of these grapes that we're talking about, uh, Merlot is the, the only one that's actually declined in acreage over the last 20 years. Which is interesting because in Bordeaux, sort of the, the homeland for all of these grapes where we take a lot of this inspiration, it is actually the largest percentage of a lot of the acreage over there. So that's a kind of uh, interesting, you know, when you go way back, you see a different story. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Petit Bordeaux um, also sort of new in Napa starting in the mid 90s. And, and for us, an important step in the process of, of growing these grapes and making these wines was when George Henry, my uncle, bought the property that had joined us to the south. And that uh, includes maybe 60 acres of vineyard, uh, and it all had to be replanted. It was all grafted to a rootstock that was dying from phylloxera. Um, and in those replantings were the first times that we did some, some of them were low, Malbec, Tiberdo, and, and Cabernet Franc. Um, and they were all things that initially George wanted to have as potential blending additions for the Cabernet. And, and as you know, uh, George has moved more and more toward bottling 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, and that sort of turned into our style. So we didn't necessarily set out to make it a Bordeaux varietal blend, but uh, it became one of the options as we moved more toward 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. So Petit Bordeaux is a very interesting grape, I think. It, it, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Petit Bordeaux all have really a, a, a very close and, and the longest ripening period here at Henry Vineyard. And, and for each of those grapes, it takes more or less 130 days from bloom to harvest. Uh, Petit Verdot can be a very intense, very structured, fantastic standalone wine. I, I think to this day, one of my favorite wines that we've ever made was a Petit Verdot that we made in 2001. Um, you know, it's still a, a very memorable wine for me, but uh, some of my least favorite wines we've ever made are also <laughs> Petit Verdot. So it, it goes both of those directions for me. Um, Cabernet Franc, we, we have about four acres of it. It's been something that um, I think for the last several years, Cabernet Franc has been on average not its most expensive grape. Um, and it's been a, for that reason, it's been a, an easy grape to sell. And, and you know, the, of the little Cab Franc we have, we've sold a bunch of that. Um, and what have I, have I missed anything? Just Cabernet Sauvignon. We all, we all know Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so the way that we make this wine, and I, I talked to George yesterday about his wine making objective with this, and he would like it to be something that is a little lighter in personality than our Cabernet typically. And I, I in the past have sort of described that as filling the space between, in, in our lineup of wines, between the Zinfandels and the Cabernet. It's something that, that brings some of that sort of expressive fruit that the, the Zinfandel has, but a little more of the structure and the range that, that the Cabernet has. Um, I, I think, you know, in some years we achieved that very well, and in other years less so. Um, I mean, sometimes that red blend is a very intense, very structured kind of wine. Um, as far as the ingredients go, uh, this isn't very helpful to you in a virtual tasting, but I have uh, a sample bottle of each of these wines. And I, I feel like in terms of tannin structure, 
really the, the Malbec and the Merlot separate themselves out as by far the lightest in Canon. In, in most years, uh, the others are, are much more structured. Uh, the Petit Verdot and the Malbec separate themselves as, as the darkest and the most intensely colored of these wines. Um, I wanted to try, this is an experiment that I was trying to do without shining the, the flashlight in the, um, these are all very darkly colored wines, but if you, if I hold up this Cabernet Franc, you can see the way the light goes through it. If I do the same thing with the Petit Verdot, there's hardly any light that, that gets through there. So, and, that, and that's, the Malbec's like that too. Um, so within Napa and, and also within Bordeaux, uh, Petit Verdot and Malbec are the, the least frequently used or the least widely planted. Um, and I feel like together they make a very natural base for a Bordeaux blend. Um, I went through and, and looked at through, through the first year we made this this Bordeaux varietal blend was 2001, um, and in every year since then, uh, except one year, uh, Malbec and Petit Verdot have been one or both of the, the, the biggest ingredients. Um, the Malbec, a, a, as I mentioned, it, it's very dark in color. It's it's very broad on the palate. It, it, I try to describe it as having a lot of weight without being particularly tannic. Um, I don't think that the Malbec on its own has, has is particularly complex. Um, as I mentioned, the, the Petit Verdot, I, I think, can have a wonderful complexity and range, uh, but sometimes it's, it's very rough around the edges and, and can be quite hard to drink on its own. So I think when you use those two as the base for a blend, um, the Malbec can sort of soften the rougher edges of the Petit Verdot, and, and the Petit Verdot can, can add complexity to the Malbec that isn't otherwise there. And, and when you're done, you have a wine that's guaranteed to turn your teeth black um, and also be quite tasty. Um, if I had to pick one wine in all of these that, that I like to drink the most on its own, right now it would probably be the Merlot. I, I think. Um, you know, that there is a, a good reason why Merlot is so widely planted and so famous. I, I think it um, finds a very nice natural balance in terms of aroma and structure and weight and ageability. Um, but I think in this blend, Merlot is often sort of a, a softening agent. Um, Cabernet Franc and, and Cabernet Sauvignon both um, contribute a lot of, of tannic structure. They can both add herbaceous, minty kind of qualities to the blend. Um, but when it all comes together, the, the red blend is, is one of my, uh, my favorite wines that we make every year. So, I, and then that's not to say I, I love it every year, but I, I don't say that many of our wines. Um, but I, I think it can, can make a very, um, very interesting and, and worthy wine. Absolutely, and some of you had sent in questions about, you know, recognizing we call these grapes the Bordeaux grapes, sort of harkening back to France and, and Bordeaux, and asking sort of you know, the difference between French and American Bordeaux and how we approach it. You know, I think as Mike said, it really has a lot to do with um, sort of what the goal is for the wine and Georgia's, you know, goal every year in creating this wine that um, sort of strikes a nice balance between all of these different elements is, is really our approach. So, you know, a lot of French Bordeaux are relying on a lot of Cab, um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. Um, ours is pretty different as Mike laid out, which I thought was pretty interesting to learn that there was that kind of historical um, uh, sort of aspects to how the blends were created. So the light, the feedback on the light is that it worked really well. And okay. so now that it has worked, I'm going to use like, oh, one by okay. one. Okay, so um, I will attempt to, so that, that Angela just mentioned that uh, the trick with the light was effective. Um, and it was sort of the, the contrast that, that to me was the easiest to see, but I'll try this with Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, that gives you an idea. Cabernet Franc, I, I well, think probably yeah. this setup it is the, the lightest in color. Um, Merlot might be similar in that. And then Malbec, um, as you can tell, it's, it's quite dark, and the, the Petit Verdot is, is similar. Um, so we, 
Yeah. Another very important thing that I that I didn't mention in terms of how this blend is made. So when the blend is made, we sit down and, and work on something that we like. But another very important and very practical component of the final blend is how much of everything we have. And I mentioned um, that Malbec in the past has, has really varied widely in terms of, of what we have to work with. That problem got a little better seven or eight years ago when we grafted that block to a new clone um, that now is really sort of consistently produced a, a reasonable amount of Malbec, which has led to two things, less variation in the Malbec concentration in the red blend, and in some years, uh, the Malbec that we bottle uh, as a variety by itself. Um, I think, as most of you know, and, and in the past, those of you that have been in our wine club for a long time, uh, we do occasionally bottle small amounts of Cabernet Franc um, and Merlot and Petit Verdot. So the, those are all things that we've done uh, as standalone wines in the past. It's usually in a quantity of uh, you know, one to three barrels, so it's never a lot. Um, so the, the factors in, in the funnel blender are, are what we like, but it's also the quantity that's available, the fruit that we're selling, whether or not we're making uh, some standalone varieties. And then again, a, a, a wine style with what's available that achieves that um, you know, sort of differentiation from the, the Cabernet, certainly. And we know we've got a lot of uh, Henry Club members on the uh, call. Uh, many of you will probably remember the blending kits that we did a couple, well, now a number of years ago. Um, and we uh, are really delighted to see that we're going to do that again. So 2018, maybe we might talk a little bit about the 2018 vintage, but um, from that year, we are able to, um, you know, bottle, or we will be able to bottle, hasn't happened yet, um, some single varietal, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot, Merlot, Malbec, and then of course we always have our Cab. So um, we're hoping to do that again and get that out to you um, within a year or so, you know, depending on sort of how things develop over the next, you know, over the next year. But um, why do you think it might we can do that in 2018? Well, um, 2018 was a really nice vintage in a lot of ways. It was, it was, yeah. <laughs> And maybe it seems even nicer because 2017 was less nice, but um, it, it was overall a, a higher crop level year um, and a very sort of consistent, even summertime and, and fall temperature. But um, one produced really nice wine, but two gave us you know more a little more fruit than we typically have. Yeah. Um. So we would love to know, you know, from, from other folks, you guys, some of you have chimed in, you know, we're drinking different vintages of the reds, and that was something that we got a lot of questions about, which was how long would these various wines um, sell are, and, and, you know, is there an optimum kind of time to be drinking them, which I think means that we should maybe have a drink here. I'm going to, I'm going to, we'll, we'll get that. to that, but I, I feel like we now need to join you in having yeah. a glass of wine. Let's talk um, a little bit about sort of, First of all, what the current release is tasting like, the 2015. So if you've got that, please drink along. If not, uh, drink anyway. And um, and then we can talk maybe a little bit about the component grapes and, and other vintages and how they might fare over the years. Great. But we should also Cheers. toast to you. Uh, thank you for your support and perseverance, in which this is a strange time for all of us. Um, and we look forward to getting through, through it soon and, and seeing you back here at the moment. So, Cheers. Cheers. Take these stuff. Yeah. So as to the question of, of ageability, I, I have in front of me, um, this is the first vintage of, of the red blend that we made. And in this case, uh, it was actually 60% Malbec the first time around. Um, and what year is that? 2001. Yeah. And that's still a beautiful bottle of wine. One of my favorite bottles of wine, period, right now, uh, is this one, which is the 2004 vintage, um, which I, I think is, yeah, I think it's a truly world class bottle of wine right now. Um, so I think all of these wines, to, to answer your question, it, it depends what you like in wine and what you're looking for, but certainly all of these wines will maintain a nice, provided you win the cork lottery, um, that they'll age very well for a long time. 
Yeah, and I think um, we've got David and Joanne here from Aligned Aid after about 2005. I don't know if you guys are currently drinking. If so, um, congrats on your um, patience. <laughs> some, of, some of us would have opened that earlier. Um, the recollections about 05? I, I haven't. I haven't I had a bottle of the 2009 last night for dinner. I, I uh, haven't had a bottle of the 2005 for a little while, but what I remember about it, I do think that it's more, I think it's similar in structure to the 04. I think it's always had a little more, um, a little more fruit aromatically. This one is a little, um, it has, has a little more of the earthy, choppy, uh, Type of notes to it. I remember the 05 as being sort of more expressive in terms of its fruit um, all the way through its life. Mm, interesting. But also very nice. Um, and are any of these, should we be decanting any of these? Um, well, you, funny you ask. I, I do, I mean, when this, these wines are younger, and, and the Malbec to me is a great example of that, th this is one of the few wines that I've had where really decanting it for a day can make it much more I mean, it's a it's a sponge for oxygen and it, it can be much more expressive with time and decanting and I, I think the red blend um when it's younger it can definitely benefit from decanting as it gets older and and that you know the aging of wine in my opinion is really about this slow controlled exposure of the wine to oxygen um and the older wines have, have had more, uh, and I think for that reason, need less oxygen initially. There are a bunch of them in the 2005, the 2006, the 2009 that I had last night um, that have a, a reasonable amount of sediment. I think wines that are, uh, maybe there, there are different types of sediment, or the, the sorts of sediments that you get from anthocyanins that settle out over time. Um, there are tartrate sediments, and sometimes the canting, um, you know, is it, nice for that. Um, but I, I think as the wines get older, that's less necessary. All right. Um, and we sort of covered this a little bit, but cellaring, you know, would these sell well? And I think um, yes. the question is yes. Yeah. And, and they, they I, th I think they all will. There, there are, I, I think Karen is so many on certainly some of these other Bordeaux varieties as well are extremely expressive of soil and site and annual variation. Um, so they, they certainly don't all start out the same, um, but all of these wines should age well. Some of them start leaner and more tannic. Some of them start as sort of richer, flatter versions of this. And, and for me, sometimes the, the very lean and tannic ones, the, the 2006 was a bit like this for me. Um, 2002 and three were as well. I feel like they needed more time to soften and became very nice. So those, those are ones that, that certainly benefited from um, some aging initially. I, I think some of the other ones can, can start with a very nice balance and, and really continue in that balance, although the personality of wine changes. So what, what is very important if you do want to age these, and I recommend that you, you do and, and at least try them that way. They can become, you know, very sort of delicate and soft and, and still you can, you get a range of aromas and flavors that you can't get any other way. And whether or not that is better or worse is, is sort of up to you, but it, it's, you know, it'd be a style of wine that you, you can't get any other way. But what is very important is that you age them with proper temperature control um, and humidity. The, the cork needs to be wet. They need to be, they, they can't be um, sitting out in a warm room or in the sun or in, you know, they need to be, they need to be, if you want them to be good 10, 15, 20 years down the road, um, you need to store them properly. Yeah, I don't know that goes for anyone really. Um, so we had a couple questions about climate and soil. So I'm wondering, Mike, if you can talk to your, your um, knowledge of our vineyard out there and, and sort of thinking about where these grapes are planted on the Henry property. Are there any um, particular, you know, particular soils that you're, you, that you have in mind when you think about planting these grapes or? Um, sure. Um, and, and very importantly, and I mentioned before that 
Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc, and Cabernet Sauvignon are the three grapes here with the longest ripening periods. They have the longest ripening period because for them, phenolic maturity is very important. Um, they, if you pick them earlier, they can be much leaner and extremely tannic and, and, and really pretty hard to drink. Um, so Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot, they're, they're both grapes that we, and when we first started planting them, we picked very stressy, very rocky, west facing slopes. Some, some of the, the shallow soils and the most difficult soils in the whole vineyard. Um, Cabernet Franc and, and Cabernet Sauvignon are both, um, you know, there are other grapes like this, other Bordeaux varieties of Carmenere that make methoxypyrazines. And methoxypyrazines, it's the same compound that green peppers make. And like the chlorinated anisols that, that give us cortate, it's something that we're very sensitive to. Um, and so Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon tend to produce more of that um in cooler wetter years where you have more more vine vigor they produce more of it early and then they they lose it over time but the, the biggest factor in how, how much there is ultimately is how much it's produced early in the season so vigorous soils for Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc can, can be a disaster um I think this these methodic cuisines can be a varietal characteristic and an interesting one, but they can also reach a point where they dominate the wine. And, and in that case, I think it, that's more of a flaw. Um, so avoiding vigorous soils and, and more vigorous soil sites, which is not typically, with, with a few small exceptions, that's not a problem that we normally suffer from here. Um, but we also, within Cabernet Sauvignon, have we have a range of, of soil sites and vine vigors where we use Cabernet Sauvignon and in some years uh, we, we prefer the Cabernet from some sites and other years and other sites and, and that's one of the reasons why uh, if you look at the back of one of our Cabernet balls it lists a number of blocks that may or may not be included so which Cabernet we like the most can also be year dependent and, and also you know because of the soil. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that is important. Um, Merlot to a, a lesser degree is, is sensitive to vine vigor and, and Malbec, I mean, I, we, we only have it in one block, so I don't have a huge range of experience with Malbec, but I, I feel like it tolerates a little more soil moisture and vine vigor. Certainly that the flavor profile consequences are not the same. It always seems when you're walking through the vineyard um, towards the end of the season that it seems obvious when you get to the Malbec because it seems so much um, more vigorous in some ways than some of the blocks around it. Yeah. it. Is that um, a varietal characteristic or do you think that's like a part of the soils and the fact that you, it's not maybe as sensitive to that vigor? I, I think it's really a, a varietal characteristic and it, it grows very vigorously early in the year. And, and Malbec has a very upright growth habit. Their their Verdot, for example, is very floppy on the chalices. Malbec wants to go straight up, and and it has a lot of lateral shoots that want to go straight up as well. And, and in fact, that it, its tendency to grow so vigorously around bloom time is one of the, the prime suspects and why it was so difficult to get consistent fruit set. They have so many growing points that are essentially cycling carbohydrates from the leaves and, and not enough it's really getting through to allow it to, to set. Hmm. Interesting. Um, you know, again, we had a couple of people asking questions about um, sort of, you know, how what we're doing compares to what they're doing in Bordeaux. And, um, you know, the fact that Bordeaux are always these blends, you know, this is something you had mentioned earlier about um, the, the long growing season that some of these grapes, you know, experience. And, um, you know, I think over there, they are not blessed with the Napa sunshine quite as much as, as we are here. You know, it's more humid. Um, you know, there, there's a big river and an estuary, and um, I think some years are, are pretty terrible weatherwise. And so that's sort of been my understanding about, um, you know, one of the reasons they have blended historically is that, you know, there were some years where they could grow really great Merlot and the cap was terrible, or, or vice versa. Um, have you noticed, I mean, our blend does change year to year. Someone had asked about that. It, it does. It's not always the same, though we do see some similarities in terms of the components, you know, um, but it, it does change year to year. Um, do you notice, do you think that our blend is as maybe um, 
whether sensitive or whether uh, dependent year to year? So I'm not a Bordeaux expert and I don't uh, <laughs> claim to be, but I, I do know that, I mean, one of the very important things about this growing region is that our annual variation has more to do with colder, warmer, and, and during the growing season and less to do with rain. I mean, we're, we're having a very interesting year right now. We're probably, we'll probably wind up this year with something like half of our annual average rainfall. Last year, we had almost twice of our average annual rainfall. So we do have a lot of variation in rainfall, but most of that rainfall comes in the winter. Um, if you combine the growing season months of June, July, August, and September, which, you know, those are the summer months, um, on average, we get about three-eighths of an inch of rain, so it doesn't rain much. I, I do know that Bordeaux, on average, gets closer to six inches of rain in, a, in, a, in that same period, um, and some years they might have a lot more. So if you have great varieties that are very sensitive to soil moisture and wine vigor, then obviously you'll, you'll have some other issues to deal with in that case. But I think the fact that, you know, these, some of these grapes are so expressive of that variation is what makes them interesting. Um, so I, I do think, you know, that the later ripening grapes here for us, when we have a late season, we pick into early to late October, um, it doesn't feel very warm in late October. There's, there's not a lot of, of not a lot of heat to ripen things anymore. There's really very little sunshine on the north sides of the line. You know, it feels like we're that, that's about all the ripening time we have. In an earlier year, uh, we're picking in early September, which can be some of the hottest weather of the year. So depending Cabernet, because it's so late, Tiberdo and Cabernet Franc too. When we get into a late year, they can get caught up into a sort of fairly extreme of getting kind of cold and rainy. And, and in a dry year, they can get caught up in a very hot, dry sort of harvest season. So that length of growing season does tend to magnify some of those differences. And, and I do think we see more annual variation in these three Great, so we do in any of our others. The cab, cab bronc, and the right. Yeah. Um, so someone here, oh hey, so Angela's passing this note in case you can't see that. <laughs> 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 I've got our cue cards here. So um, hi Kurt, Kurt has asked, um, he said he's heard that more wineries are leaning more on Merlot these days for, for blends, whereas maybe they would use more cab before. Is there a shift that we're seeing in more Merlot is being used? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I think I've said before that, you know, Merlot is a famous grape for a very good reason. And I, I think that if more people tasted Bordeaux varieties and blind tastings and bought what they liked the most, I think there would be a lot more Merlot. Um, I do think that it's certainly true in Napa, whatever becomes popular in a, in a given decade tends to be what people plant a lot of, and, it, and it's the more mediocre vineyard sites that plant to those kinds of grapes. And I, I think you tend to see, you know, an, an increase in price and in many cases a decline in quality. Um, there has been, and, and I think, you know, I don't know how much of this is true. I, when Merlot was certainly riding a wave of popularity in, in the 90s, um, and there were a lot more plantings of Merlot. I can, I can have some, some numbers for you here. Between, um, between 1990 and 1995, Merlot and Napa went from 1,500 acres to 4,200 acres. So it, it almost tripled in plantings. Um, and then, and everybody blames the movie Sideways. Maybe this is true, maybe it's not. But even if it is true, I think that all of us who enjoy wine and, and those of us who grow wine should all be embarrassed a little bit by how something so trivial can actually affect what people think about this kind of grape. Um, so there's no doubt that for the last 20 years or so, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon's been the thing here, and Merlot hasn't, but 
I'm expecting people to, you know, rediscover Merlot and remember why they liked it so much. And I, I do hear more inquiries about Merlot now. Um, and I, I, you know, there, there are supply and demand issues with all of these grapes. And, and um, I can sort of tell you again between, let's see, in, in uh, 2018, there were 4,300 acres of Merlot. Um, and in 2010, there were 6,200. So it, it's gone down almost a third. So yeah, Merlot is, good Merlot is fantastic. And I, I think now that there are, you know, I, if, if I'm in a restaurant and I'm looking for a really good bottle of wine for a better price from Napa, I'm, I'm usually buying a bottle of Merlot. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would say from just a consumption perspective, I feel like you can go to a lot of wineries here. And of course, we can only speak to what we're doing, but um, in terms of how they're, you know, putting their wines together. But um, I think it's, it's you can find a fabulous Merlot for half the price of, over, you know, of whatever that, that winery is. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think it's great. But, you know, as Mike said, I think a lot of this, it's, you know, about the, that year's weather and, you know, what we're trying to achieve with the wine, but, but some of it comes down to economics as well. So my guess for maybe is that places are relying on it more from a financial perspective, right? You can get some great Merlot for a little yeah. less money. But I, I think, and, and this may be changing, but I, and I get in trouble when I say this sometimes, but I, I feel like one of the things I don't like about Napa now is that you get paid more to produce Terrible Cabernet Sauvignon and Great Merlot or Zinfandel or, or something else. And, and so it is, you know, it, it's still the average price of Merlot is probably less than half of the average price of Cabernet Sauvignon. So it, it, is a, it is a smaller niche and maybe a less competitive one, but also looking at average grape prices, Merlot has a long way to go right now. Yeah. Um, well, that said, um, there is some great cab out there, and in three weeks, we're going to be tasting cab here. So <laughs> if you want to taste some great cab, tune in. Uh, in late April, we'll be comparing two of our cabs. But um, so back to some other questions. David uh, asks, um, Mike had mentioned Opus One earlier. Is it true Opus One sources grapes from the Henry Vineyard? They, they don't anymore, but for um, a couple of decades, they did. Um, and George, George still talks about the fact that and, and I'm trying to think of where to start here. It's, I think Mondavi's Reserve Cabernet and Opus One are both two of the, the Cabernets, and, and Opus technically is a, a Bordeaux varietal blend. Um, but th those are two of the wines that really put Napa on the map as a place for Cabernet. And I think we play that decent role in the production of those wines for, for a period of years. So starting in the mid 80s, really, and, and then the last year that we sold the oldest one was 2003. Um, yeah, we, we for, for a number of years, really all of the production of Bucky Cabernet, and then in, in more recent years, some of our new um, Cabernet plantings went to, to Opus One and, and Monavi. Um, this is a great question. Thank you, Michael. This is about yeast. So this also makes me think that maybe on one of our, our virtual tastings, we should get Jan in here. Um, she, she works a lot with um, that part of the process. But uh, the question is, how much does yeast or do yeast varieties affect the grape combination when we're putting this blend together? Do we experiment with different? So, yeah, I mean, yeast is a big topic. Um, it's also not one that I'm, I consider myself an expert on. I'm, I'm, I make some wine. I'm not the, the winemaker for Andrea. I, I feel like there are yeasts that, well, let, let me, let me put it this way. I, I still don't know anybody who can taste a wine and tell me what kind of yeast was used to make it. Um, there are a number of very good studies that look at both the tolerance and the ability of yeast to function under different conditions, as well as produce different aromatics. And this is a big topic in, in beer as well. Um, and there are, I'm not a beer expert either, but I think there are some very distinctive yeast strains that are used in beer. Um, I think for us, from a winemaking standpoint, one of the fundamentals when it comes to choosing a yeast is choosing one that we know will finish the fermentation. 
Um, in some of the experimentation we've done with yeast over the years, we've run into problems having the fermentation finish, um, which is always a, a harvest time nightmare. But we do use different yeast in our, in our white wines. We use a different yeast for the rosé. And, and uh, for most of our red wines, we use a, a, PD, a, str a strain of PDM. Um, which is? PC1118 is the, the brand that we buy. So in that, you know, technically it's a champagne yeast, but it's used in everything. It's used in a lot of very nice Chardonnays, it's used in the reds, it's a very hearty, tolerant strain of yeast. So there are people I, I know that um, experiment more with yeast than, than we do. We, we use a number of different ones, but um, we're, we're not, uh, we're, we're, I think more, well, yeah, we, that, that's basically the, the way we do it. We, yeah, so if that's of interest, we can have a whole session. We could get Jan in here to talk all about you. Um, so I think we've covered a lot of the questions that folks had about these particular grapes and, and our blending process and, and how we grow them. Um, one question people, of course, always have is what would you pair with these wines? Um, would, Angela put a little teaser question in there if uh, it's down in the chat. Uh, if you've done George's tasting before, you've probably heard him say that uh, this is his pot roast wine. Courtney Reynolds. Courtney Reynolds. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I can see uh, lots of other um, suggestions coming in. So maybe we'll um, go through because now I'm getting hungry. Someone's talking about butterfly like lamb. That sounds delicious. Yeah. Um, that might actually be quite a, quite a real master. That would be something that you could. Um, Think do quite well, but maybe we'll take some of these suggestions. And my father-in-law raises lamb, so uh, a, a source. Yes, yeah, a source. I yeah. have a lamb. It's a <laughs> the, the Henry Ranch is not a terrible place to be quarantined. Um, yeah. if you're, if you're figuring out, but um, maybe we'll take some of those suggestions. Um, people are talking about mushroom risotto and things like that, and throw them up onto Facebook and Instagram, and um, we can have a whole a long list of things to cook during this quarantine. So. Um, is there anything in particular, Mike, um, that you enjoy cooking when you're serving there? I mean, I, I like the red with a lot of things. It, 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 is, it is a wine with a lot of, um, it, it has a lot of structure, a lot of intensity, a lot of flavor. It's not a wine that pairs very well with very delicate food. Um, but beyond that, I mean, it's really good with pizza. It's <laughs> really good with lamb and beef. Um, short ribs, that's a good one. Short ribs is a great one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like block 28 with short ribs. Block 28. So tune but in. Good with short ribs. <laughs> we're just gonna, we're gonna, um, we're, we're all gonna be very hungry after this. Good thing it's getting to be dinner time. But um, yeah, next week, as I uh, previewed, we will talk about the block 28 and the block 7 and 22 Zinfandel. So um, many of you know that Zin is near and dear to our hearts here, and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, well, some funny comments. How many in. people wish they were quarantined with us, you guys? <laughs> we wish you were quarantined with us. No. Uh, we're, we're missing all of you. So, um, so please do keep the, the, the comments and the questions coming. Um, you know, we've sent out that list of tastings that we're going to do every Friday. So this time, mark the calendar every week. Um, we're going to do these tastings. We've got them set up through Friday, May 1st. Um, we'll continue them if, if people find them interesting. Um, if you have other, um, other topics that you want to tackle or questions for us, please, please let us know. I have a question for you. Oh. Yeah. Do you think we should open this bottle of one? I think we should. I mean, it would, I, I, I feel like we wouldn't be really doing our job if we couldn't tell you exactly how this is tasting right now. So. And is it okay if it opens? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. You guys have to get yeah. approval yeah. for yeah. things, right? Who's <laughs> really running the show? So, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll taste this, let you know what it's like. We'll get some extra glasses here. Um, so yeah, next week we're going to do Zinfandel, um, we're going to do a cab comparison, as I mentioned. Um, Mike talked a little bit about climate, um, and in fact, we've got a question here that if it's okay with the viewer, I'm going to hold off on this question about climate, you know, Oak Knoll and Lower Mount Peter, where we are versus sort of Up Valley, um, because we can tackle that, I think, uh, in a couple weeks when we talk about climate. It's a big topic. I know Mike has some thoughts. I mean, I can, yeah, I can, I can, I can try. I, get a little you know, and then I think Megan's worried that I'll use up all my ammunition for that particular <laughs> talk, but um, so that I, I think the, the perception is that when it comes to growing grapes, 
in the southern end of the valley, it's freezing cold, and in the northern end of the valley, it's it's scorching hot. And in truth, it, it is more complicated than that. Um, I think, you know, Oaknall, Coombsville, it, it sort of spans a latitude in the valley. And one of the um, important things about that latitude that, that you can see a reflection of the climate in the, the varieties of grapes that are grown there. And those growing regions are, are more diverse in terms of varieties than what you see uh, either north or south. Um, so, but I, but I also think, and I, I will talk more about this in another um, virtual tasting, but I, I do think that it, it gets more complicated even within regions and, and some of the regions that are often assumed to be cold and aren't necessarily like that. And, and some of the ones that are warmer aren't, aren't certainly like that in every year. So um, right. it is, I mean, if, if, I hope you join us for that one and I will um, well, use up all my ammunition there. Yeah, we will like to share charts and graphs and get real geeky um, and advance with that, it should be kind of fun. Um, one, so as we're sort of doing research for this, you know, um, one interesting uh, tidbit that we learned, you know, last year, I believe last summer, um, the, the governing body in Bordeaux, where again, we're, you know, all these, these grapes working from, um, approved seven new varieties, four of which are red, that can now go into the official Bordeaux uh, wines there. And they were largely planned to, they're, permitting that because they're seeing changes with overall and climate and they're looking at temperatures and worried about climate change and all of that. So that was kind of an interesting little, um, another aspect of this is there are certainly variations year to year, but then some trends as well, so. Yeah, and I, I don't, I feel like historically there have been a number of varieties in Bordeaux that aren't necessarily called Bordeaux varieties anymore. So, you know, Carmen Air is an obvious one, but um, more Tau. Which is is a, also goes by Cabernet Pepper historically in California is uh, apparently an old Bordeaux variety as well. And so I don't I don't know I don't know enough to I don't know enough yeah. to. But yeah, but I think it's just an interesting. I mean, climate has, there, it's, a, it's a big subject, right? And I think there's a lot we can discuss with that. But um, yeah, I'd be curious in the chat if anyone's ever heard previously of Cabernet Pepper. It's a yeah. new one for us. So this, I think it's super good. It, it's the, the color is a little bit, there's a little bit of a brickish tinge. I mean, it, it's now 19 years old. Um, you know, I think the fruit is moderated somewhat, but there's there's almost a little brown sugar note to me and, and some sort of baking spice kind of stuff. There's still some some darker berry fruit, I think. Um, but it's, it's very soft. It has a very sort of delicate texture. It's beautiful. So yeah, the fruit is actually still remarkably present, I yeah. think, you know, as I think something people have, everyone expects that to sort of diminish um, as the wine ages. Um, but this is this is pretty darn good. Um, so if you've got one of those older older reds, don't hesitate to open it. Um, or yeah. send it back to us if we like it. <laughs> yeah, if you just can't bring yourself to do it. <laughs> I don't know who that would be, yeah. but we'll we'll happily take one for the team. Um, so but uh, and any other questions, burning questions that are uh, coming in? So since he's not here, a lot of people are asking about George. George. And how's George, George doing today? George is George is doing great. He's uh, I don't know if he's enjoying the quiet days at the winery, <laughs> but we see him walking around the vineyard a lot. Um, he often has it's not really his dog, but it's sort of his dog, but he has a small dog, Gracie and Poe. Um and the weather, you know, we, we, we would like more rain, but the, the weather has been beautiful for walking around near the dog. So um, George is doing very well. Yeah, and we want to, you know, we want to be responsible and follow all the sort of social distancing rules, but we will um, find a way to, um, you know, share maybe a, a day in the life of George or something like that with you all. And, um, you know, we are doing, <laughs> uh, as best we can, we're, we're trying to become a 21st century winery here in terms of our um, the tools we're using. So um, we're, we're starting to do more on social media. Um, if it feels new to you, don't worry, it feels new to us too. So bear with us. But um, we hope to be sharing. I don't think we'd be doing any of this without Megan. And Angela, Teresa, Tamara, it's been a, a real team effort here. So, um, but do follow us along there because our hope is that we can use that um, to share some materials in advance of these tastings. Um, but also kind of give you um, a little insight, um, you know, Mike can speak to this 
a little bit. It's a really busy time here in the vineyard. So while it's quiet here in the tasting room, um, there's a lot happening out there. So it would be really fun, I think, to um, sort of show that to everybody. And um, if there, again, if there are particular things you're interested in learning um, or see, please do send send questions our way. We would we would love to uh, try and answer them as best we can. Can we shine some light through that O1 red? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's got a label on it. So yeah. Well, let me, I feel like this is going to require a full glass. <laughs> oh, <darn. laughs> I feel like everyone now is going to be walking around at home with a flashlight in their glasses. So here's what we're going to do. This will be a little more difficult, but let's see. Can you see that? Is it working? A little bit. No, nope. actually that go. hurts. <laughs> so still, um, I don't know how well you can see that. Let me try the next one. Which one was that? That was the that was the old one. This is the. Ooh, ooh. I don't know if you can. It's a little tricky. Maybe your screen's better than ours, but it, it wasn't. Uh, it certainly wasn't obvious the difference there. Um, the color is still still great though in the old one. Yeah, you see a little bit of that a slightly brown tint to it, but it's not um, it, it's not faded dramatically at all. Other questions? Yeah, I said, oh darn, yeah. we're gonna have to we're gonna have to drink that. But um, well. This seems like a good place to sort of wrap it up. Um, as I said, we tried to get to as many questions as we can, but um, we do have a lot of all of this. And so if there's something that we can get to, we'll, we'll try and uh, um, address it uh, either on social media or in another tasting. So um, thank you again. I mean, I, I Mike mentioned this at the beginning, but um, on behalf of Angela, who's been um, amazing the last two weeks, you know, she, she's um, carrying a lot right now for all of us over here at the winery. We've been really touched by um, all of the calls and emails, you know, asking how we're doing and um, the orders. You know, we, we've known that we had a wonderful wine club for a long time. You guys um, are proving that yet again and, and all of our fans. So um, we're really we're very fortunate in this moment. Um, we're thinking of everyone and um, we're glad to be in this age with all this technology to, to bring us, to beam us into your living rooms. <laughs> um, so please do um, come back and, and visit us. And, um, keep the questions coming, keep the love coming, and, and we're looking forward to seeing you again. We appreciate you guys, and, and if you can think of ways or, or topics or things to improve, please let us know. Yeah. If, you know. We have a week till the next one. If you think of a good question sometime between now and then, you know, yeah. email it to, to Megan.com <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer it. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Bye.